From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 199, recorded on October 8th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. The uh, weather is the same as it was on TWIV just a little while ago. <laughs> Partly cloudy, uh, a little bit humid, but uh, nice temperatures and um, a very, very nice, warm fall day. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And from Glasgow. Christina Naula. Hi, nice to see you again. When I say Glasgow, I get hungry. I want to have, I want <laughs> to have. deep fried, deep fried <laughs> Mars bar, deep fried pizza. Uh, <laughs> Haggis, Actually, you want I, Haggis? I just want some stout because it's so thick, it's like a mm. meal, right? It is really, yeah. Nice pubs in Glasgow. I've been to uh, to have stout. All right, let's move on because I'm really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> we have hey, a now case. Now that everyone is tuning back, <laughs> we have a case. Uh, the case was presented by Christina last time, so let's have you represent it, Christina, and then we'll see what happened. Okay, so I'm going to do the short version of that because I think my initial presentation was quite lengthy, and just to reiterate, this was not my own case. This was a case that was given to me by a diploma in tropical medicine students, and I'll tell you more about that later. So this is the case of a 31-year-old woman. She was previously healthy, and she had traveled to Tanzania, and she went on a safari to see all these beautiful, um, big savannah animals. And after she came home, she developed a fever and a really bad headache. And so bad that she had to go to hospital. So some investigations were done, among them thick blood smears, um, which were negative. Um, the physical examination was normal. She did have a small lesion near her buttocks um, that was uh, noted. And based on that, um, she was started on treatment for African tick bite fever. But she didn't get better and the lesion grew in size um, the biopsy was examined and nothing was really seen. She got better, went home. And then 10 days later, she just had another episode of fever um, that disappeared again after a couple of days. And the lesion healed. Um, but after she went home, a week later, she did present with another um, three-day um, fever episode. And that's where we left you, I think, to think about the case, although I have left out quite a lot of details. So, <laughs> um, but I think it was a difficult enough um, case. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. All right. Uh, why don't you take that okay. first uh, guess, Christina? Okay. So, Sarah writes, Dear Dr. Fracaniello, De Pommier, Griffin and Naula, I'm listening on a sunny, humid, 78 Fahrenheit evening in Philadelphia. Thank you for another wonderful episode with fascinating case. I struggle with this case. There you are. This is a, <laughs> <laughs> this is a 30 year old woman presenting with a fever and a severe headache one week after returning from an 11 day safari in Tanzania, found to have an expanding painless purple lesion with leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and a mild bump, a mind pump in her liver enzymes. My first, my mind first jumped to Rickettsia Africa, which presents with an SCAR and can cause fever and thrombocytopenia. Scrub typhus, another Rickettsial species, would have presented similarly. However, following presumptive treatment for Rickettsial disease, she did not get, she did not do better. The lesion grew, and she returned with a cyclic returning fevers lasting three days. This sounds like Borrelia recurrentis, a spirochete. However, she had PCR for Borrelia species sent that were negative. Thick and thin blood smears were negative for Plasmodium species and presumably Trypanosoma species, though those were not mentioned. 
She seroconverted for rickettsia antibodies, but we weren't given a four-fold rise in titers and her fevers recurred after a course of doxycycline. I don't know what to make of those antibodies. She could have been bitten by a sandfly and developed cutaneous leishmania. However, the isolated nature of the lesion that was not described as ulcerating banished leishmania from my differential. Could her purple lesion have been a trypanosomal chancre from a tsetse fly bite? Maybe it was missed because only one set of blood smears were obtained. I remember trypanosomal species with the mnemonic Chagas, Kisses, Cruzi, Brucei bites. Since tsetse fly bites can transmit trypanosoma brucei while kissing buck feces within a bite will transmit Chagas disease. The problem with trypanosoma for this patient is that I believe those chancres are painful and this patient did not have pain in the area. I'm thoroughly stumped. Against my better judgment, I'm guessing trypanosoma brucei, even though I really want this to be a case of relapsing fever from, from a Borrelia species. Anxiously awaiting a final diagnosis, Sarah, who is an MD candidate. Wow. Daniel. All right. I love the way people think this through. I mean, I love the whole thought process. So Jody writes, on Christina's student's case of the pyretic safari goer with a lesion near her rear, although a quick trip through PD-7, it is not exactly a feast for the eyes. Lesion is now officially my least favorite word for control F for within the PDF due to the associated photographs. Seven years of avid TWIP consumption have apparently not yet cured my squeamishness. And I admit I do much of my reading while holding a hand up to cover a photo or two. I absolutely love the complex life cycles and disease ecology, and I have tremendous compassion for the poor people suffering in these photos. But clearly, a career in clinical parasitology is not in the cards for me. In her presentation of the case, Christina mentioned specifically that blood smears were taken when the patient did not have a fever, which led me down a surprisingly tough path with Dr. Google. I was sure I'd easily find plenty of papers discussing a specific pathogen or two that can only be diagnosed via blood smear when the patient is actively febrile. Sadly, no, I thought I might have stumbled upon it with the louse-born rickettsia, rouse louse-born relapsing fever caused by Borrelia recurrentis, but I believe that the PCR test would have picked this up. I think our patient may have had an unlucky encounter with a sandfly and the Leishmania donovani or L. infantum she was carrying, Cala azar or visceral leishmaniasis is characterized by skin sores, a high intermittent fever, anemia, low blood counts, and hepatosplenomegaly, to name a few. As the venerable authors of PD-7 state, diagnosing the disease can require a high index of suspicion as many presentations are similar to the other febrile diseases common in the areas where VL is endemic. This is a tough one, but I'm going with VL. I've already won a book, though I'm still eagerly awaiting its signing and shipment. So please don't enter me in the guesser's grab bag. Thanks, Jody. Dixon. Daniel writes, greetings, TWIP team. I've been recently listening to some of the first TWIP episodes, even taking notes all the way. And now I guess you could say that I'm, I I guess you could say the power of Dixon flows through me. Hmm. I think the answer you are looking for is triptastic. More specifically, East African trypanosomiasis caused by the parasite trypanosoma brucei brucei rhodesiensis. Oh, right now I have to uh, explain why I came to this conclusion. In East Africa, the tsetse fly vector breeds in the open plains where uh, many different mam mammals can act as reservoir hosts. Going on a safari would put this woman at risk for exposure, but if she stayed on more domesticated land, she wouldn't be in as much risk because they uh, eliminate tsetse flies to protect precious cattle. About a week after being bitten, an ulcer called a shankar will form. This is the initial site of T. brucei replication, but does not stay there. It enters the circulatory system. Soon after, lymph nodes on the back of the neck will begin to enlarge, known as winter bottom sign. This sign could be uh, easily missed by the women, as they uh, in women, by they are on the as they are on the back of the neck, and they also would have disappeared from her before her visit to the hospital. Her first bout with fever would have cleared 99% of the protozoan. 
which is why the blood smears were negative. Also, the biopsy of the Shankar was taken too late as T. brucei has already left. The small percentage of T. brucei that invaded the immune system will then replicate until another fever occurs. This variation in the T. brucei coat protein is remarkable. I wonder if it is due to proofreading mistakes or some random recombination of this gene. Anyway, these doctors were very unlucky with their blood smears. They should have taken a smear before the fever when the population was high. I now realize that there are quite a few assumptions here. How many assumptions are too many assumptions when making a diagnosis? My other guess would have been visceral leishmaniasis, which can cause dromedary fever. But a lesion at the bite would only have occurred if it was cutaneous leishmaniasis, unless you can develop visceral leishmaniasis from cutaneous leishmaniasis. Did the lesion disappear? If it did, then it's definitely not leishmaniasis. Cheers. Daniel from Vancouver, Canada. It sounded like he was talking to us, <laughs> right? <laughs> Gabriel writes, hello from Baja, California. It seems the 31-year-old woman may have been bitten by a tick of the genus Ambiloma, infected with rickettsia, likely R. africae, making her eventually seropositive. And a secondary pathogen causing her to have relapsing fever, Borrelia, would have fit the symptoms nicely, but was discarded. So, supposing that it is not a bacteria, being this is TWIP, I suggest Babesia species, a intraerythrocytic protozoan parasite transmitted by ticks, causing from no symptoms to fever, headache, chills, anemia, fatigue, malaise, and a few others, treated with etovaquone along with azithromycin or clindamycin along with quinine. I found none of these medications would have been used for her first identified rickettsia infection, where doxycycline, chlorophenicol, or ciproflaxin were likely prescribed. I'd expect the Babesia symptoms to be amplified by the co-infection, at least during the pre-treatment phase of the rickettsia, and remain unaffected by the rickettsia treatment. At least the last fever must have been caused exclusively by this protozoan, supposing that the rickettsia was resolved by the medication. A small purple lesion is mentioned for the tick bite area where rickettsia is involved. Thank you, Gabriel. Christina. Andrew writes, Kia ora from Pangaroa. No book one yet. Will I be the first incubator winner? Mm -hmm. I like my books warm. <laughs> 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 the weather here is fine and 16 centigrades. The woman who went on safari in Tanzania, I think, has trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness. She seems to have antibodies for rickettsia, but it's not this week in bacteria. So that is a bit of a red herring. That said, a 2012 paper in Science Direct indicates that the tsetse fly, Glossina morsitans, that transmits trypanosoma, may also harbor rickettsia felis, and gives a link for that paper. If my guess is right, she has been infected with the subspecies Trypanosoma brucei vodiziensi, found in this region of Africa and will probably soon be developing the neurological symptoms. According to PD7, if the disease has not reached the CNS, then the treatment of choice is suramine. However, as this does not cross the blood-brain barrier, melarsoprol is the only effective drug for treatment of TB rhodesiense and comes with a risk of encephalopathy. I can't speak today. Encep encephalopathy. There we are. Nah, Andrew. <laughs> none of <laughs> us were trying to help you because none of us knew how to say that word. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some words, you just stumble over them. <laughs> Daniel. All right. Martha writes, dear Twip, I'm writing to you more promptly than is usual for me since I am flying off for a month's vacation. Usually I like to ruminate on the problem for a while. But here is my quick analysis of the problem of the young woman returning from safari in Tanzania with a fever that occurs and a purple lesion on the upper thigh. No mention of swimming, so eliminate those parasites acquired aquatically. No mention of paintball fights, so I guess the purple lesion is from the bite of a vector. So focus on vector-borne disease. If I were the patient, I would want to make sure this was not human African trypanosomiasis, HAT, caused by Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense. Since this East African version of the disease can progress more quickly to neurological involvement and 
death. Her clinical presentation and lab work are consistent with this, including the false positive for rickettsia. Although the bite of the tsetse fly is reportedly painful, some people take insect pests in stride and don't complain much unless specifically asked. I would suggest that you go ahead with treatment for HAT while continuing to test and observe. Best wishes to you all. Dixon. Kevin writes. <clears throat> Dear TWIP doctors, I'm still dealing with some COVID-19 induced fatigue, but while I'm quarantined, I might as well throw in a guess for the episode 192 case study. My clinical course is relatively mild. I will wager leishmaniasis. I am doubtful, but here is my reasoning. It sounded like the patient remembered some event related to lesions, perhaps the bite of a sandfly. The time course is perhaps on the quick side for the development of a Leishmania lesion, two weeks, but plausible. A painless purple lesion fits cutaneous Leishmaniasis, but those lesions typically result from multiple papules, and I don't know if that fits the single small lesion description. If the lesion was not sampled properly, the histology may have missed the trypanosomes. The symptoms the patient experienced line up somewhat uh, with visceral Leishmaniasis, bouts of fever and anemia. However, there was also little evidence of hepatic or splenic effects other than a C-reactive protein, which I'd expect from visceral, uh, visceral leishmaniasis. I didn't find a description of a leishmania species that could cause a cutaneous lesion as well as these visceral symptoms, but it sounds plausible. Cutaneous leishmaniasis lesions leave victims vulnerable to secondary bacterial infections, possibly explaining her becoming rickettsia positive. Thanks for keeping me edutained while I recover, Kevin. I forgot to mention, this is the first twip from the incubator. Yes. That's why, yes. That's that's why Andrew. Is it, is it warm there, Vincent? Yes, it's very warm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a thermostat on the wall, and it's set on like 76, but it, the AC just keeps kicking in. I don't think the thermostat works. Because <laughs> ah. I don't need it to be cool in here, I, uh, you know. I'd rather not hear the AC. Did you change the nitrogen tank? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this week I didn't have to. Oh, good. All right. The next one is from the University of Central Lancashire Parasitology Club members who write, Dear Twit Professors, hello again from this University of Central Lancashire in the autumnal northwest of England. We were absolutely delighted to win a signed copy of PD-7 for our response to the TWIP-197 case of cyclosporiasis. Dr. Naula's new fascinating case has some intriguing signs and symptoms for the patient, and it has also given us a real headache. <laughs> Periodic fever was immediately suggestive of malaria, and advice on travel to Tanzania from the UK government highlights malaria, dengue fever, and cholera as the greatest risks. There were no details about taking antimalarial prophylaxis, and we wondered if the patient may have had a low parasitemia that evaded detection by thick and thin blood film. The patient was treated for the African tick bite fever caused by rickettsia africa and subsequently seroconverted to positive for rickettsia antibodies. So it's plausible that the patient had an infection that was successfully treated, and this may account for the eschar at the inoculation site, but was also suffering from an additional parasitic infection with Plasmodium falciparum. A report from Jelinek et al. 2002 described a cluster of cases of African seeping sickness in travelers to Tanzanian national parks caused by the East African form Trypanosoma brucei rodensi rodensiense. The diagnostic features included the Trypanosome chancre at the tsetse bite, fly bite site, which seems to fit with the eroding lesion in this case, and identification of trypanosomes in thick and thin blood films, which were negative in this case. So, altogether, we are unclear of the cause, but we'll put our tanner, a Lancashire term for six pence in old money, <laughs> on a dual infection with rickettsia africa and plasmodium falciparum. Thank you, as always, for your wonderful podcasts. And stimulating case studies, we are waiting excitedly by the post box to receive the signed copy of PD7. Don't wait! Don't wait too long. It'll be a bit. <laughs> it's going to be a bit before we get to that. Uh, okay, Christina. Mm, I just wanted to say I really like how this um, letter is referenced properly. It is. I find that is really impressive. 
Okay, Katie Jane writes, hi everyone, 16C and raining here in north central Wisconsin. Our fall colors peaked last weekend and wow, were they beautiful this year. The leaves are now falling and it's starting to look like October. I find this case rather tricky, but I've got the last two wrong, so I need to redeem myself. Actually, I probably need to win a book. Either way, I'll keep trying. My first thought was a soil-borne helminth, such as cutaneous larva migrans from a hookworm infection. However, those are very itchy, don't produce fevers, and it's rare to have systemic problems. Next, I thought of African trypanosomiasis, or sleeping sickness. PD7 states that people infected with T. brucei rhodesiensi get severe headaches and intermittent fevers. I was going with rhodesiensi rather than gambiensi due to Tanzania being the travel history. This infection also occurs in people who have traveled to game parks, for example, for a safari. However, trypanosomes should show up on blood smear and the blood smear was negative. Next up is cutaneous leishmaniasis. The symptoms don't seem to fit and the biopsy of the lesion would have shown parasites, which it didn't. Also, how does rickettsia fit into this? Co-infection with African tick bite fever could be a possibility, but I think I can do better. What about visceral leishmaniasis? That certainly induces intermittent bouts of fever, but is usually accompanied by splenomegaly and has an incubation period of several months, not one week, as with our patient. Although not impossible, it is not, un, it is not common in Tanzania. I'm clutching at straws here because of the mention of seroconversion to rickettsia. Oncocerca volvulus for causing river blindness is known for causing river blindness, but I remember from early TRIP episodes that the parasites can also house the rickettsia-like organisms, Wolbachia. PD7 gives the distribution as Western and Central Africa. Can Tanzania be counted as Central Africa? According to the WH website, maybe. However, in cases of oncodermatitis, the only type that might show a skin lesion, usually there are multiple lesions. And according to PD7, if there are fewer than five lesions, most cases are asymptomatic. Back to African trypanosomiasis for further evaluation. PD7 states that fevers coincide with organisms entering the bloodstream. So if the blood smears were only taken when she didn't have a fever, would they still show up on the blood smear? PD7 also states that thick blood smears miss a large percentage of infections. This seems like it fits the bill, but the zero conversion to rickettsia was still tripping me up. We did a little more inter- I did a little more internet digging, fell down a few more rabbit holes, and then found what I think I needed. According to medicalecology.org, female tsetse flies carrying rickettsia-like organisms are six times more likely to be infected with trypanosomes than those without. Therefore, I think our unlucky traveller was bitten by a trypanosome rickettsia-infected tsetse fly and has the early stages of African sleeping sickness. If left untreated, this disease is fatal, so I hope her story has a happier ending. Thanks for making me think. If I'm wrong again, I still enjoyed the process. And that's Katie Ann from Dixon. also in Wisconsin. Dixon, this medicalecology.org is one of your websites. I see that, and it's amazing <laughs> that it's still up. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yep. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Well, a bit, a bit of a thin uh, serving of guesses this week, No. Yes. I think it was so challenging. I think a lot of people were uh, intimidated, Christina. By yeah. Yes, I think so. I think maybe if I left out some details, it would have been easier. So ah, I'll keep that in mind for another case. <laughs> I'm really interested to hear Daniel's take on this. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I think Daniel has. I think Daniel made the diagnosis. No. Well, I'm basing that on the paper he had chosen originally to discuss on the. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, why don't I think through out loud and then I'll hopefully you'll answer one of my questions. Um, so I, I went through, you know, you, you always start with where, where the geography, what's in that geography. And I think some of our emailers did a great job with that. 
Um, the the other thing was the lesion, right? And that's sort of where I went with this. With right. African tick bite fever, so rickettsia africae, um, you know, we always say that the the African ticks travel in packs. I don't know if that's the right term for for ticks. You know, different terms for different groups. So I'm not sure. Yeah. What what are they? What is it? Is it a pack? What is the right terminology? I, I, a pustule of ticks, I would say. <laughs> a murder of crows. <laughs> that's right. That, um, that's called heraldry. The heraldry of the, uh, the like murder of crows. That's right. Yeah. So so often with the um, with the African tick bite fever, it won't just be a single lesion. It'll often be you'll see several. Um, also, the fever um, tends to melt away with starting therapy. You give doxycycline within 24 hours, they're just like, oh my gosh, I'm all better. Um, so I started focusing even more. Um, maybe this person remembers um, having a, an exquisite sudden pain in that site. And we sort of were asking where it was relative to their clothing. So sort of getting me to think, you know, maybe this was a tsetse fly bite. Um, and so sort of going down that road, that was my, that was my highest suspicion. Now, um, why was the testing negative? And I think some of our we don't know if I'm right yet because Christina knows the answer. But um, if <laughs> if I am right, why was the test negative? And I think some of our um, emailers wrote in addresses is this tends to often be a, a posse um, organismal um, disease um, sort of with the whole challenge. Like if there's so few organisms, how, how does this even complete its life cycle? And particularly as described after that fever. So, you know, doing the um, the blood smears well. Um, the person is not febrile, um, you're going to have a low sensitivity here. So ideally, you're in a part of the world where you can do like a card agglutination test, or you have a nucleic acid amplification test, a more sensitive um, test. Um, you may also in this syndrome con consider a lumbar puncture doing a CSF analysis. Um, so yeah, every everything that was described so far for me was, um, well, compelling, encouraging, consistent with um, <laughs> East African sleeping sickness. But I don't know. I should let Dixon and Vincent, you guys should probably. Well, uh, who, who you want to go first? Dixon. Dixon. I'll, I'll go. Um, I wouldn't dare disagree with a co author. <laughs> 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 I think all of the uh, bullet points that Daniel just mentioned, particularly the jabbing pain-like experience of having been bitten by something. Ticks are the stealthiest organisms on the planet. You don't know you're being bitten by a tick. It takes a full day for the tick to actually engorge. It's a very slow process of inserting the proboscis under the skin to get to the blood supply. And therefore, you would never know that you're being bitten. And that's why animals can be covered with ticks and they're not bothered by them except that they start to obviously suffer from loss of blood, et cetera, and, and, and the diseases they transmit. But for, for my money, I, I agree that uh, this was a Setsi flyby. They are very painful. They're, you remember them. Anybody who's ever been bitten by one does. And, of course, in East Africa, the uh, trypanosome of choice in this case would be trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense. Um, Again, the, uh, the progression of the disease, which is fairly early on, and lucky her, because there is a drug to treat the blood stage form before it gets involved in the CNS. Um, everything fits. It's too bad that they didn't do a winter bottoms sign check just to see if there were a few lymph nodes that didn't go all the way down, because they don't go down. They go up really fast, right, Daniel? But they don't go down fast. Yeah, and that's another potential diagnostic, right? If you find a lymph node, you can actually do an aspirate sometimes. Yeah, that's too. right. That's right. So that's if, if they had found swollen lymph nodes, then that would have been, um, and especially at the nuchal crest in the back of the neck, uh, that's where you would expect to find them. Uh, otherwise, um, you're right. There's a paucity of uh, clinical data <laughs> to support our contention. But since this is a TWIP and not a, a TWIM, I would I would have guessed Brulio recurrentus otherwise, but uh, I go with trypanosomiasis. I would agree. I think the bite is clear and uh, the the disease trypanosomiasis. Yeah, I don't. I think the rickettsia antibodies were a red herring. <laughs> Oop! <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I like this last person's idea that <laughs> they were bitten by a tick that had both, but. 
I'm not sure that that's the case. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, we're, we're, if we're completely wrong, Christina, you will no, edit you this are completely out right. we'll <laughs> No, you are actually completely right. So this was a um, oh, case good. of human African trypanosomiasis. Oh, right. And actually, this was so this was sent to me that case by my student Eyal Leshem, who has actually published a, published a case report cool. on that. And part of the title is Diagnostic Pitfalls. So that's really just to illustrate that wasn't only a difficult case for our audience, but actually also for the treating clinicians. Indeed. And Dixon, you did mention the winter's bottom sign. I, I just omitted that from my... Um, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> from the case Thank you, Christina, for that little red herring. <laughs> so she did actually present with that. The reason why I left that out um, yeah, is really obvious, because right? it's, it is much less common in East African trypanosomiasis than it would be in um, West African trypanosomiasis. And um, I, I don't know, I just felt I wanted it to be very clearly. Um, I thought you were discriminating because I think wasn't Winterbottom a Scottish a Scottish uh, position? <laughs> you know, I'm not even sure, actually. <laughs> Could very, very well be right. Yeah, and uh, actually, I left you at the state at the stage um, of diagnosis. So the next step would have been they did a, they did another blood smear at the right time, and they did actually find a small number of trypanosomes in the blood. Excellent. Um, and actually, th this is quite problematic. We always teach our TTMH student, and they have to do that for their examination. They have to be able to diagnose trypanosomiasis from a blood smear, but actually you know, often you, you can't really detect the trypanosomes in the blood smear unless you concentrate the blood, which in this um, clinic they didn't do. It's so um, although Rhodesienzi can produce a higher parasitemia, I think that Gambienzi subspecies. But anyway, they did eventually find that she um, did have trypanosomes in the blood and they did also a lumbar puncture and they could show that she had not progressed yet to um, neuroinvasive disease. And she was successfully treated with suramine and made a few non-remarkable recovery. Wow. And I, actually, they do discuss all these kind of, you know, red herrings in there. And apparently, it, it, it's not uncommon. Or I, I wouldn't know that, but maybe Daniel can comment on that. Um, that um, there are false positive seroconversion events. Now, I don't know. Um, I don't really have the required background to comment on that. That's just something I picked up from AL. And um, yeah, but I think if this was TWIM, I would probably also have gone for maybe <laughs> Rickettsia, rec um, Borrelia recurrentis infection. Sure, sure. Um, but then she would have improved much quicker. Um, up on treatment. So. There's a, a very famous uh, pathologist's statement that is, uh, when you hear hoofbeats, uh, don't think of zebras, think of horses, because it's more common to think of a horse with a hoofbeat for most diseases, especially if you live in the United States. But if you're in Africa, <laughs> when you hear hoof breeds, <laughs> certainly think of zebras first and then yeah. <laughs> wildebeest <laughs> and uh, gnu. You know, that's yeah. just insane. But, you know, yeah. so it's difficult to get a, a non-African clinician to make this diagnosis because they never see that. They never see this disease. Mm. Actually, what I also find interesting because, you know, that is really in, in the, there aren't really all that many cases of human African trypanosomiasis, yeah, that's right. particularly that's right. that's East right. African human African trypanosomiasis, but apparently cases are rising in, in travelers, so it's becoming a little bit more yes. common as the diagnosis in returning travelers. And I, I guess that um, kind of reflects our, um, you know, sense of adventure. We want to it's true. Go on safari and, oh, I would love to actually. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the so, other thing is that uh, setsi flies are attracted to movement. And that's why they, they will move towards, let's say, an animal that's grazing. Um, but so are the vehicles that the tourists are in. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And they're all decked out in these minivans that are all painted up like zebras so that they can blend into the background. And the tussie flies will attack that as well. And once it's there, of course, there's a, a human host instead of a, an animal host. Good all stuff. Right. Good. Very good. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting case. Absolutely. Know, Daniel, well if you wanted to comment well on those presented. zero conversion events. Yeah, no, I'm not that I'm not no. that familiar with the zero conversion. Yeah. So. Me, me neither. So I thought I'll just skip over that. Yeah. I, I sort of <laughs> exited from my mind. I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. All right. No, you, uh, well. Did very well. Let's give away a book. We had okay. seven seven eligible entrants. <laughs> We'll roll the drums. First book given away from the incubator. Yes. Number four. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Congratulations. Number four. Let's see. It's Andrew. Is that Andrew? Yeah. Andrew, you got the first book from the incubator since you like your books warm. You got it. And That's right, yes. <laughs> so, Andrew, send uh, your address to twip at microbe.tv and your phone. And once we get everyone here and sign them, we'll we'll ship them out. Dixon, you're going to ship some books here, right? Muted. You're muted. No, I'm muted. I'm muted. And now I'm unmuted. <laughs> yes, we're going to send probably 100 books to the, off, to the incubator. And then um, Daniel and I shall meet. And we will get sore wrists signing all of them. What did you say, Suris? You're going to get Suris? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I usually travel business class. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. And you, uh, as soon as you're healed, you can come here, Dixon, right? This is all true. I can carry. I, I'm, I, I'm fairly ambulatory right now, so I, I could probably come anytime you want it. So you could be driven here, correct? That's easy. That's an easy deal, too. And That's you, right. you could get out and come right. You get out the curb. You walk a short distance to the door. You get in exactly. the elevator, and you're here. Right? No, no, no. Yeah. This, this is an easy deal. You just have to pick a day. That's all. Okay. Very good. Uh, next week, uh, it'll be almost all furnished and uh, be good. Right. So, you so can we s- should uh, notify the uh, printer to send the books because that might take some time to get there. Yeah. Do you want me to do that, Dixon, or are you going to Would you that? please? All yep, right, I'll take sure. care of it. I, I knew I was going to get. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, you just have to send it to the freight elevator, which is a different address, Daniel. I'll have to give that to you because they don't want that. They don't want boxes in the uh, passenger elevator. Naturally, naturally. Now, as many of you may have heard this week, uh, the first ever malaria vaccine has been uh, backed by the WHO. Approved. I don't know what that means, though, to, for them to approve it. I guess it could be given in some countries that actually listen to them as opposed to the U.S., right? <laughs> <laughs> but right. Um, we thought we'd chat about this. So I've got uh, a nature commentary and um, the a phase three um, article on the testing. We could chat about what this is. Um, but this is called RTS, S. <laughs> and... Uh, been worked on for 30 years. It's, of course, Plasmodium falciparum. Uh, and um, unfortunately, only about 30% vaccine uh, efficacy. You need four injections in kids under the age of five. So, um, but still, 30% is good if you have, you know, tens of thousands of infections, right? Now, Vincent, when true. you say vaccine efficacy, efficacy against what? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Severe malaria. Right. Uh, yeah. So, in fact, we can look at that. We have the paper here. But um, it's it's actually called Moschirix. M-O-S-Q-U-I-R-I-X. It costs 750 bucks to develop this, Ouch. mostly paid by the Gates Foundation right. and GlaxoSmithKline. Um, so, um, it's, it's, uh, quite an, you know, it's quite a momentous uh, occasion, right? I, I think this is huge, right? I mean, this, this is really like, um, you know, sort of a time to be remembered, you know, 2021 when the first, the first malaria vaccine was introduced, that's the first right. effective malaria vaccine. Was the introduced. first effective, that's exactly Yeah, so right. this is, yeah, so this is, this is huge. Um, and I think, what you know th- these are some you know i sort of 
poked at this, but now people maybe are starting to be a little more sophisticated with vaccines, um, you know, because we have data on the, the reduction in clinical malaria. We have the reduction in severe malaria. Um, there's going to be sort of more nuance as we go forward. But, but prior to COVID-19, right, 500,000 children were dying every year of malaria. That's sort of a prior to, um, you know, the PEPFAR program and uh, say Bush Jr. It was a thousand, it was a million every year were dying, right? So, you know, these are huge numbers. So, you know, you take, you take 500,000 and most people that die are dying of severe malaria and you remove a third, you're talking about saving a lot of lives. It's true. I think, yeah, I think more than 100,000 children really, yeah. Yeah. Even There's at another, 30%. Yes. Another aspect to this um, is that this vaccine is designed to prevent infection. 100% effective. It has to be 100% effective. If even one sporozoite makes it to the liver into a parenchymal cell, the patient gets infected. If that's a remarkable achievement, if you look at 30% as 100% sterile immunity, that's incredible. Uh, tell me another vaccine that does that. I don't understand and, uh, what you're saying. I, here's what I'm saying. The the vaccine itself, yes. they said it's been worked on for 30 years, but it's been longer than that, I guess. Uh, originally discovered at NYU by Jerry Vandenberg and colleagues, and then by the Nussenzweigs as well. The sporozoite portion of the life cycle of this parasite, which is the injectable form that the mosquito gives to you as it takes a blood meal, the surface coat of this stage is a repeated quadrupeptide and it covers the entire surface just like the trypanosome variant antigen coat coats the entire trypanosome um, they thought that the quadrupeptide which has an antigenic signature would be a perfect vaccine candidate and for 20 years they tried very hard to exploit this because the original finding was that if you radiate these sporozoids so they're not um, they can't carry out the life cycle, but they're still alive enough to infect. Those irradiated sporozoites induce 100% immunity in a mouse version of this infection called Plasmodium burgii. So if you take that and translate that into Plasmodium falciparum, uh, getting a lot of trypanosome, uh, uh, getting a lot of the uh, sporozoite stage for uh, P. falciparum is a huge task. You have to dissect out the salivary glands of mosquitoes and uh, the female mosquitoes that have been infected with the parasite, of course. And then you have to collect the sporozoites, and then you have to do something with them. Mostly, they ground them up and put them into adjuvants and tried them, and nothing worked. That, that was horrible stuff, and uh, the patients suffered from lesions that uh, were induced by the adjuvants almost. Then uh, someone actually tried to use irradiated plasmodium falciparum sporozoites. Uh, Stephen Hoffman and his colleagues at Sandia. And, and they got a good protection, a good level of protection, telling them the level of protection is equivalent to the original findings for P. burgii. So that's then all of this new stuff. And Vincent, I asked you, you know, when we were prior to the show starting, why they chose hepatitis B uh, surface coat, um, the single protein that defines the coat for hepatitis B virus, and you you hesitated, and then you say, oh, yes, because it self-assembles into a capsid-like coating. So they take the antigen, the whole antigen of how, how big is it? How big is that, Dixon? What, the antigen? Yep. Oh, it's, it's the entire surface of the sporozoite, if you want to look at it that way. So it's got, it's, it's huge. So they, they can stuff a whole bunch of protein inside the capsid. And then a, a pseudovirus. Well, actually, or it's, on the, it's probably on the surface, I would guess, not inside. Yeah. yeah and you then could, you could inject it. it. And the next thing you know, because it, then it targets the liver, because there are receptors in the liver that actually interface with this, those quadrupeptides. And, um, and from that point on, the sporozoite can gain entrance into the uh, parenchymal cells. And this stops that process. So I think. 30%, when you look at 30%, it's not 30% of the disease, it's 30% of the infection. Because if you get infected, you're going to get sick. 
I guess that's the point is like, even if you get any sporozoites to the hepatic stage, they're going to multiply. So you got to, which is pretty, pretty high bar. If you think about this, it's very high bar. It's incredible high bar. This is sterilizing. And you only have minutes. You have minutes to do it. Um, This is all has to be antibody mediated. So you've got to somehow four injections. Yeah. So you got to somehow maintain a high enough level of antibodies that um, right. when this minute, of just minutes to to neutralize and destroy all the sporozoites before they get just even one gets to the liver stage. Exactly. Uh, there are other vaccines, right? Like at the liver stage. But that was interesting. And, I, and my favorite is figure three. It's like the booster figure. You know, what if you don't give that booster at was 20 months? What happens? And you basically are losing your vaccine efficacy against um, severe malaria. So yeah, really you got to. So this becomes a challenge. Right. And this is going to be interesting going forward. Um, we really are going to need to have a global vaccine program. Um Probably not just for malaria, maybe I would for agree. COVID as well. Maybe we, you know, this is to really keep this under control. It isn't just, you know, four and done, let's say. Uh, <laughs> this may, <laughs> this may need a repeated uh, schedule um, to, to continue to hold this efficacy. Yeah. And then right. I think, right, with sterilizing, you're going to start reducing the pool of infected humans that can be bitten by mosquitoes, um, you can really start to sort of move in a positive direction, not just this 30%, we saved 150,000 children this year, maybe next year it's more and more as you keep sort of digging away here. Mm. It would be the problem, though, is that it. after you're a child and you get to be a teenager, you're now susceptible to the infection again, but you won't die from it. But you're, you're, you can still be diminished by it. And so the there were lots of studies on infection with prefalciparum. Or it's, it's also known as cerebral malaria uh, because it causes uh, the patient to go into a coma. Those patients that are not infected are measured for their ability to think through problems and solve you know, pattern recognitions, et cetera. Then they get infected then they get the same tests again and they don't do as well in those tests. And the more you get infected, the less well you do on those tests. So there are some serious side effects of, of repeated infections in adults, which doesn't really to the death rate, but it also relates to the ability to produce a normal life, productivity, work, interaction, social interactions, et cetera. So that's that's another issue, of course. This issue addresses childhood mortality. Yeah, and, um, I think I think that's huge, Dixon, because here we're you know we're looking at a really hard um, objective outcome: death, um, clinical malaria in yes. children and infants. Yes, yes, yes. But boy, just think of the impact on productivity in no in, in sub-Saharan Africa, actually yeah, parts of Asia as well. You know, people always constantly at low level sick anemic, not right. able to, you know, enjoy life, be as productive. That's right. Um, I mean, th- this, you know, this is a really big, I mean, really is a big step in yes. a positive direction. No, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So Daniel, the, uh, this was done in like 11 different countries uh, in Africa. And this figure three, there's an interesting figure where they report the vaccine efficacy against either clinical malaria or severe malaria by country. And it varies yeah. Very widely by country, yes. so Isn't some some it's it's nothing, and others it's over fifty percent. What's the cause of that, Daniel? Mm. Yeah, I mean, th- I have to say, this is one of those times when you're like, why are there paywalls? Why can't everyone see this? Right, and the, <laughs> the Lance has this behind a paywall; it just kills me. Someone should have anteed up and made this open access. Maybe someone still can, um, because it is really interesting when you look at um, you look at the two different. You look at with and without the booster. So A is without the booster, and B column B is with. And at the top, you've got clinical malaria, and bottom you have severe malaria. And you look at some, like so, we'll look at clinical malaria in in Kenya and you're, you're up in the eighties, mm. right? I mean, there's wide confidence intervals. Um, and you know, it's really interesting to see various countries. You go to Mozambique and you're actually starting to sort of cross the zero, um, impact with your confidence interval. So, so that is actually a really important question is what is the difference? Is it the, the amount of exposure to malaria in a place like Kenya versus Mozambique? Um, is there a certain amount of exposure? So they have the long way Malawi where they tend to do quite well. Um, and they're comparing that to um, what I'll say Burkina Faso, which is, which is not as good. 
Um, and so there may be, I mean, these might be important differences as, you know, as we said, this is a really high bar. You've got to not let any of the sporozoites into the liver. If you keep being bit and bit, is that good or bad? Are the repeated exposures going to get those antibodies and keep them up? Are the repeated exposures going to finally break through? So I think that's a great question. I don't think this paper gives us the answer. That's a, that's a remarkable uh, follow-up on that too, Daniel, because you say you're, you're repeatedly bitten. And you know the stat on that. And I think just to tell the audience that every day, little kids get bitten about a thousand times a day by mosquitoes, 1,000 times. And if even 0.1% of all the mosquitoes are infected with plasmodium, which is about correct, you're going to get infected. I mean, it's almost a guarantee. Yeah. And so only that, about one in a hundred females are double biters, right? So you got to be a double ah, biter. That's you also true. That, get that that, that's up. exactly right. You got to so get got infected. You got to go. You have enough time to go through the the life cycle in the mosquito. Then you got to bite someone again. If you were looking at this from a statistical point of view, you'd swear there was no malaria at all. <laughs> it's like the bumblebee. <laughs> There's no way it can fly. Exactly right. There's exactly no right. And yet. Work. They they do it the same way that herring reproduce in the ocean to avoid being eliminated by predators. They just produce billions of them. And okay, you can have a, a percentage, but you can't have us all. And that, I think that's exactly the way this parasite functions as well. well. One aspect of this study I find fascinating, especially compared to vaccine trials here in the U.S. So who was was the subject group? Infants, 6 to 12 weeks, and children, 5 to 17 months. Those are not adults first, but kids. <laughs> <laughs> like in, in this guys. country, we excluded yeah. all the kids from COVID vaccine trials from the start, and we had to catch up with them. But this is interesting. Yeah, that's who dies. That's right. But yeah. um, it shows that you don't need to go in adults first. <laughs> to, oh, heck no. And so, Daniel, what is the the logic for that here in the U.S.? We only do 18 and up first in clinical trials, and then we later get kids. Is there a reason or a rationale, or is that just a historical precedent? Yeah, it depends what you're talking about. Like, let's take the a rotavirus vaccine. And so I was going to say that. It is something that tends to really target children. We'll switch the paradigm. Um, but otherwise, I think it's this perception um, of wanting to try it in a, I don't know if you know, Vincent, when you, when you reached 18, you became less valuable to us. Um. <laughs> <laughs> is it because at the onset, COVID was thought to not involve less than 18 years of age? Was that part of the equation? I think that was part of it, right? If, huh. if COVID did not affect people over the age of 18, if we had, you know, 150, 200,000 kids getting infected every week, if we had thousands of kids in the hospital, if we had kids dying every week, um, if it was just a disease that affected under 18, we would have been looking at what can we do in that age group and doing our studies there. Yeah, so polio is like that, right, Vincent? I, I was just going to say polio was only trialed in kids because that's who it paralyzes mainly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah. No, but I'm just curious about the COVID vaccines uh, specifically. A lot of people say, why didn't we test it in kids? And uh, we should have. I'm quite sure there's yeah, no reason. It, it's a shame we didn't do maybe parallel. We're sort of now realizing that, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, every every but, week that a few more children die, it's, um, it's, it's tragedy. Well, as you know, think, Daniel, some very prominent public health people said kids don't get infected. So That's right. Yeah. They did. Kids, kids, it is true. Kids don't get infected if they don't get exposed. But when you expose our children, they get infected. Um, and then a percentage of them do not do well. So Right. Uh, this this is a trial that's been going on for a long time. This started in 2009. I mean, look at all the variables, and I wonder how many of the original subjects on both the controls and the experimental, I wonder how many of those people dropped out of this study just because you can't do follow-up for four separate immunizations on everybody. It's very, very difficult, and... Uh, there must have been a lot of caseworkers involved in this and a lot of families and uh, local leaders that, that convince people it's worthwhile staying in this because they know what the mortality rate is for this. It's very high in some areas. So this was worth staying with, I think. So this is uh, being going to be used in Africa. Anywhere else this will be used? India. I just read today that it India? was uh, going to be picked up in India also. Yeah. Okay. You know. 
but there are plenty of other places where this is valid. I mean, you know, all of South America, mostly, uh, wherever malaria is endemic. Uh, yeah, sure. Christina, we should let you jump in. I, I think that Dix and I got so excited. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, I've been really interested to follow your conversation. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering, you discussed earlier about, you know, the differences, the regional differences. And I was wondering if maybe also trial setup might have contributed to that a little bit. I don't know. It could be. Um, I was thinking about that, but I was kind of trying to frantically going through the paper and finding information about that, but I couldn't couldn't find any. So, um, but I'm sure that must cross must have crossed their minds as well. Mm-hmm. But it may also just be because of the local pop- mosquito populations that are more or less infected, or you know, at least one of these locations on the list is is quite um, is um, quite near the ocean. So I, th- I think you tend to get less malaria infections, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So, Dan, you want to comment on, they had a number of severe adverse events here, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, quarter, the meningitis, yeah. And one of them was meningitis, and a, mm. but a quarter of the kids, they said, had severe adverse events. So why do you think that is? It's, do you think it's the vaccine? It's the age group or both? You know, it's interesting because they said the frequency of severe adverse events was balanced between the two different groups. Um, yeah. You know, it, it is interesting, right? When you're, you're in a study and you're in an area where a lot of people get, you know, bad things happening. And so let's say you're on the, you're either the PI or on the data safety monitoring board. You know, this child has a fever. This child has meningitis. Oh, maybe it's meningococcal, right? Because you're in the meningitis belt. Um, you know, it, unfortunately, in an area like Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, um, kids are getting sick all the time. And the way a trial is set up, whenever someone has a fever or someone has a problem, it gets reported. And then what you're then challenged to do is say, is it associated with the treatment? And so what we're seeing here is actually, it, it doesn't look like there's an association. It looks like it was balanced. Um, and that was actually maybe to the point of Christina was bringing up, there was a lot of um, sort of micro analysis of, are the people in the different areas doing a really good job of adequately reporting the serious adverse events? Because yeah, there are a couple of people you're like, hey, these people aren't having much serious adverse events reported to us, but these other, we're seeing a higher percent. So um, that's a great thing about having it in so many countries, so many centers, you get this nice balance. But that would be my my sort of take is this is an area of the world where kids don't go through a year without having, um, yeah, yeah. you know. All right. Anything else? Now, exciting stuff. Very good. And we're obviously they're going to be distributing this vaccine. They're going to be following up. We'll have more data coming in the coming years. So it should be very interesting. All right. Now that brings us to a new clinical case. I'm not sure if Daniel has any more, but let's ask him. <laughs> so I have two and I'm like the whole day I was kind of going through in my mind, which one to throw out there. Should I do, two. should I do a summer appropriate case? Should I maybe do a case dealing with an organism that, that we haven't really discussed much on the show and I'm going with the latter. Um, so here, here's a gentleman um, that was referred to me by a gastroenterologist. Um, and this is a this is a gentleman in his 40s um, who has had repeated intestinal issues. Um, he was diagnosed with giardia. He was treated for that. About a year later, again, diagnosed with giardia. And this was not clinical. This was actually uh, documented uh, test positive. Again, treated for giardia, did well for a while. And now he's sent to me because he is, again, not feeling well. And his stool testing is showing um, blastocystis and endolimax nana. And so the the question is, what is going on and what to do? So let's get a little more history. Um, This is a gentleman who lives in the the New York City uh, tri-state area. Um, He likes to go into the city and... and, uh, He's, he's, he's single um, and he's, he's active socially with, uh, with different partners. Um, he, takes, um, he has no other medical problems on this ongoing recurrent GI distress issue, um, but he does take um, uh, a, a medicine Descovy on a regular basis, a pre-exposure prophylactic pill. Um, he has no surgical history. 
Um, he reports he's not allergic to anything. He says that um, family history, really nothing going on. No one else in the family. It's really just him having these stomach issues. Um, he doesn't smoke. Uh, he'll he'll drink socially, um, sometimes more more than you know, more than your average Irishman. Um, he, <laughs> uh, he reports uh, no fevers, no chills, no weight loss. But yeah, when when um, he periodically will have this GI discomfort. When he's seeing me now, um, he feels that um, he's got abdominal pressure. He doesn't feel right. His stools are a little bit looser than normal. Um, on exam, there's really nothing. I mean, he he looks quite well, um, head to toe. Um, abdominal exam, non tender, no hepatosplenomegaly. Um, labs are all pretty much unremarkable except for the stool studies. So, um, what about his CD4 count? Um, so he is actually HIV negative. So he's on the Discovy as a prophylaxis. So he's HIV negative, normal, um, cells, etc. And he lives alone, right? Uh, yes, yes. Any diarrhea? No, no, he's he's feeling fine. Just this, just this. So his bowel, his bowel functions are normal, but he's got now two other organisms beside the one he was diagnosed with. Yeah, and they didn't see it on the other diagnoses, so they and they yeah, so looked. This is, this is new. Like he's had repeated, and this these are new. Now, okay, these are new. This is now new. So I'm going to add a little more to our story, and that's where we're going to. Um, so so we have a discussion, and we go ahead and we treat him with metronidazole three times a day. Um, for a period of time, no impact on the symptoms. No. And so now is the question of, of what is going on? What do we do next? What do we make of all this? Right. Which symptoms are those again? Um, so he's got he's got abdominal discomfort. He's got bloating. He doesn't feel abdominal great. Abdominal discomfort. That's not diarrhea. That's just a discomfort. No, just discomfort. No diarrhea. Stools, you know, occasionally are a little less formed, but not, no diarrhea. All right. Appetite. Bloated and windy. What's that? Bloated and windy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that a weather report? With a chance of uh, <laughs> chance of rain. <laughs> Daniel, is uh, appetite's okay? Yeah, his appetite's okay. It and doesn't feel great. Does he, at the, the first incidents years ago when he first was diagnosed, does he recall, did he travel at the time? Did he do anything uh, different? Well, he does relate this to um, when he has sort of successful um, connections socially and is able to get together with folks. So, so he's always never had a great stomach, but then when he became sexually active uh, after encounters, he would, you know, have issues, feel crummy for a while, um, then you get better, and then sort of this timing issue. And he doesn't go camping and drink water in the woods or anything like that, right? He's a New Yorker. No, <laughs> he does not. He's a New Yorker, that's right. More of a, more of a city boy. <laughs> okay. He doesn't even go to Long Island, right? No, no, he he comes out to Long Island. I actually saw him in my office in Long Island. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Yes, to be continued. <laughs> That's curious. I like that. Very good. All right. That's it for TWIP 199. The next one is number 200. A big one. Wow. So... We will find a date, which will probably be in a month or so. Right. As Dixon said, we'll probably just say, this is 200 and go and do the same thing, right? <laughs> you know, well, I you hope know, we don't. I hope we, uh, you know. Depending on the timing, the um, American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene meeting yes, yes, is, yes, yes. is next month. Um, it's virtual, so there won't be a lot of travel. So we can sort of be there virtually. Um, and also next month is when we switch over to supporting American Society for Tropical Medicine. So right. We'll have to look into the timing. Isn't there some yeah. meeting in person that you're going to? Yeah, they canceled it. They canceled it. Oh, that was this one that you're talking about. Yeah, Dick Dixon yeah. voted. Dixon voted to cancel it. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, he did not. He was. Uh, he abstained. He abstained. I didn't want to be a naysayer, but I, I, you know, as soon as you ask that question and you know what's going on out there, these are health conscious people. Nobody wants to catch this thing if they can help it. Yeah. So I don't blame them for canceling. Right I, now, I so. suggest that three of us fly to Glasgow and do it there. 
That'd be great. Absolutely, yes. Although we would be do terrific. have quite a lot of COVID cases here too. You, so do? you might not oh. be any safer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we do have nice pups. Yeah. No, part part of the issue with the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene is it tends to be a very international meeting. There's a lot mm-hmm. of representation. Right. From, That's right. from Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, South America. And so, you know, it, really tough for those individuals to travel to from. Um, so, yeah, I think it was the right choice. Well, so, they had travel <laughs> restrictions anyway. Yeah. Right? yeah. Here's I think they've only just lifted the UK travel restrictions to the US actually yeah. just last right, month. Right, that's just happened. So, well, well here, here's my proposal for TWIP 200 at Dixon and Daniel. You come here to the incubator. Sure. And we'll set up a big TV so uh, we can all see Christina. I'll <laughs> come. Right. I'll come. It's just a five-hour flight. <laughs> we, have little, we have to get hats and horns. <laughs> and um, wanted some confetti. <laughs> if there are any local uh, fans here in the city, they could come and sit. We have a little bit of space for a few uh, visitors to watch. Only masked. Only masked. So. Masked and vaccinated. Only, yeah, masked and vaccinated. Yeah, yeah you that's have right. To, you have to show us your vaccine card at the door and uh, exactly wear a mask. But uh, but at least the three of us can be here. What do you think? It sounds like, like it. a lot of fun. And yeah. it sounds like Christina is willing to fly over, so we'll have to chat with her about that. Yeah. Well, actually, that's right. That's right. I don't have a recognized vaccine. Remember? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's right. true. That's true. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I, I spoke with Sarah Gilbert. Uh, on the latest TWIV, the, one of the developers of the AstraZeneca vaccine, right? She's not allowed here either because that's what mm. she's had. <laughs> and that's not approved in the U.S. <laughs> I think she had AstraZeneca, hasn't she? Yeah, that's the yeah, one she's I've, I've, Yeah, I've had Novavax, so that's yeah. not even been approved anywhere. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Also, also highly efficacious. So. I mean, I asked her if it would ever be approved in the U.S. And she said she thought it would be. She said the problem is... They're continuously collecting data from the trial, and the FDA always wants all of it. So as soon as they get them more data, then there's more data, and they say, we want it all, we want it all, we want it all. And so but of course, but of course. It just keeps going Stop on. collecting data. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's uh, TWIP199. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you want to take a guess, you send an email to twip at microbe.tv. If you want to send some money our way, which would be nice if you like what we do, <laughs> you can support us. There are a few ways you can do that. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute, or you can go to parasiteswithoutborders.com where yep. Daniel can take your money as well. You bet. <laughs> He might even give you some back. <laughs> Dixon de Palmier is at uh, trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. This is good. Very good. Very informative. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, and parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, my pleasure. Christina Naula is at the University of Glasgow. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed that. And I forgot to mention earlier, I will post the case paper to you oh, for the show right. notes, um, just to give proper credit, really, to our students. That would be great. Very good. So it was, was good to be here. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, you were worried before you couldn't pronounce things, but it is very late at night for you, so it's, an, it's a good excuse. <laughs> it is, yeah. And you're it's Scottish, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have that excuse, Daniel. <laughs> That's true, actually. You're Swiss. <laughs> yeah. So I take it, Christina, that you don't really like single malts, right? I'm not very keen, no. Too I think bad. they taste a bit too strong for me. Oh, it's too bad. They're lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is Parasitic. Par- 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 Par-